Plato in his dialogues outlined what he called the forms. He believed that the essence of something was not the shape of it or the matter of which it was composed or its color or any other physical property. He believed that we are able to recognize an object because we know its essence through its form. The form to Plato was some ethereal thing that no one could see or touch but that existed nonetheless. So, in Plato's mind, there was the form which did not exist in time or space and there is the manifestation of the form which is what we see. So, the form of a triangle is an idea not created by humans but the triangle that we see is. In Platonic, Platonic philosophy, the triangle form is greater than the physical representation of it because it is more perfect and it has no flaw. So therefore, it cannot be less than something that exists in the physical world. Consider some beautiful thing. Say, an incredibly beautiful sunset, the, the kind that totally absorbs you in a profound sense of beauty and wonder. Now, instead of pausing in that experience alone, which is our usual tendency, elevate your thoughts still higher and consider that this is not the only beautiful thing. There are many other experiences equally or more beautiful than this one. Then consider that there must be something in common amongst all these experiences. In exactly the same way that there is something in common for all triangles, all horses or all trees. That is, each of these things has some defining principle or principles, some essence. Consider further that a defining essence has, at least in theory, some existence outside of its instantiation in actual examples. Hence, we may conceive of the abstract form of a triangle, which would exist even if somehow we were able to remove all physical triangles from the world. If so, we may also suppose that there is some form of beauty, which is the principle that all beautiful things have in common, and that this may potentially exist independently of all beautiful things. Moreover, beauty is not the only good. There are also such noble things as truth, virtue, excellence and justice, which we also unhesitatingly consider good, which delight or assure us and which can bring us very deep levels of satisfaction. And just as with beauty, we may suppose that there is some essence or form for each of these other things, a form, a form of truth, a form of virtue, a form of excellence, a form of justice and so on. And finally, we may contemplate the possibility of some principle or essence which all of these different forms of good have in common. This too would be a form, the form of goodness. God is defined as that being than which nothing can be more good. Therefore, God, according to Plato, is the form of goodness. In the Phaedo, one of the Platonic Dialogues, Plato argues that the existence of the form of the good, which is the highest and most perfect good, it requires the existence of a divine source that is responsible for its creation. Now, though it is, this is not a, a fully logically persuasive argument for God's existence, it can be approached as a contemplative or a spiritual exercise. That is, as Plato himself presents this line of thought, one is not so much trying to logically convince oneself as to elicit by performing this exercise an elevation of the mind to an awakening or remembrance, an amnesis of an innate, intuitive understanding of God. We might then call this an experiential proof. It is important to recall that Plato sees a form as the ideal essence of something, a transcendent entity that is perfect, immutable, indivisible. The things of our everyday world are imperfect copies of the forms. They are multiple, but the forms themselves are one. For example, there are many different kinds of cats. Some have black fur, some gray, some orange even. There are many different breeds and cat owners might say that every cat has his own distinct personality. There is, however, something that all ha cats have, have in common, namely catness, you could say. According to Plato, the many cats are merely a facsimile of the form cat. We call all the different cats in the world by one name because they have that form in common. Plato believed that forms exist as essences in a transcendental or supralunar world. They are apprehensible rather than sensible and constitute the objects of our knowledge. The chief problem, Parmenides says, is figuring out the exact relationship between the form and the particular. How does a particular partake in the form? How is the form incarnated in the particular? Consider 
again the example of cats how can the form cat be infused in each individual cat while remaining indivisible and one how does the perfect ideal intermingle with its imperfect copy a second problem is one of limits of how many particular things in the world can it be said that there is a form socrates would say that there is a form for beauty for youth sorry for truth for virtue and justice and for any number of other things but parmenides wonders if there is also a form for hair and mud and dirt socrates concedes i have often been puzzled about those things parmenides whether one should say that the same thing is true in their case or not so one of the problems with the theory of forms is that does the individual partake of the whole idea or only of a part to either view there are objections if the former one thing is in many places at once if the latter the idea is divisible and a thing which has a part of smallness which will be smaller than absolute smallness which is absurd b when an individual partakes of an idea the individual and the idea are similar therefore there will have to be another idea embracing embracing both the particulars and the original idea and there will have to be yet another embracing the particulars and the two ideas and so on thus every idea instead of being one becomes an infinite series of ideas this is the same as aristotle's argument of the third man which which was uh, him criticizing plato's theory of forms secondly thirdly rather socrates suggests that perhaps ideas or are only thoughts but parmenides points out that thoughts must be of something ideas cannot resemble the particulars that partake of them for the reason given in b above that when an individual partakes of an idea the individual and the idea are similar lastly ideas if there are any must be unknown to us because our knowledge is not absolute if god's knowledge is absolute he will not know us and therefore cannot rule us